Good evening. My name is Dr. Inamauer. I'm a GYN oncologist in the local area. First and most off, I do apologize that I am not here tonight. I uh, had other uh, plans that just didn't work out. But I was asked to give a discussion or a lecture on GYN cancers and also kind of relate it to lymphedema, which you'll have another discussion with regards to. So today I just am going to go through uh, three of the most common gynecologic cancers that I deal with on a daily basis. And with all of them, you'll see a revolving theme that I can cause lymphedema with my surgeries, which can be very troublesome. So kind of getting into the subject um, as a matter, if you look at this uh, table, it shows that um, two of my cancers, uterine cancer and ovarian cancer, are amongst the top cancers diagnosed in women. Now, if you look at cancer deaths, those two are also in the top of the cancers that cause death in women. As you can see, cervical cancer, which is the third cancer I will discuss, is no longer on these charts. It used to be the number one cancer of women as well as the number one cancer killer of women, but we've done a very good job of helping to prevent this from occurring. And like I said, you'll see a trend when I go over treatment that lymphedema is a complication of all three of these cancers, as well as other cancers that I deal with, including vulvar cancer, which is even less common. Now going into ovarian cancer, um, this is the one that we probably hear about the most. Um, it used to be cervical cancer, uh, but now we've done a really good job with pap smears. Ovarian cancer, um, survival is related to stage at diagnosis. When you look at the five-year uh, overall survival, you can see there's a trend from going um, less likely to die at five years to more likely to die the higher the age. The problem with this graph is that patients at the diagnosis of ovarian cancer um, are more likely to be at advanced stages when they're diagnosed. And if you look, this is 67% of all the patients that are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So we don't do a very good job at diagnosing these women, unfortunately, in early stage, which actually has a very good overall survival. So when you look at overall five-year survival, it's less than 45% for all stages of ovarian cancer. People are typically asymptomatic when they present with ovarian cancer. Um, the symptoms are very ill-defined. A lot of them we have on a daily basis when it comes down to it. This could include bloating, abdominal pelvic pain, increased abdominal size, difficulty eating, always feeling that you're full, um, urinary frequency and urgency. So on a daily basis, I have some of these symptoms, um, but these tend to stay more persistent in women that have ovarian cancer. So can we screen for ovarian cancer? That's the most important thing. And unfortunately, we can't. Um, so who are the people that are diagnosed with ovarian cancer? Well, the general population risk is actually very small. It's less than 2%. Now, the incident does increase with age. Uh, dip, uh, it's also dependent on ethnicity. The mean age at diagnosis is in the mid-50s. And also, women with hereditary um, genetic predisposition are at much increased risk for ovarian cancer. Risk factors, as I just said, was genetic predisposition, age, nulliparity, meaning that you have had no babies, uh, infertility, especially going through infertility treatments, early age of having periods, um, stopping periods at a later age, estrogen use uh, in postmenopausal state, and also environmental factors such as talc and cigarette smoke, and then lastly, obesity. So how can we protect ourselves? Oral contraceptives have been shown to be very, very good at protecting oneself from ovarian cancer. In non-family, uh, or in patients with a non-family history could protect up to 45% or reduce your risk of ovarian cancer by 45%. And those with a family history, almost up to 90%. Also having the tubes tied, doing a hysterectomy, and breastfeeding uh, after uh, pregnancy. Now, if you look at the risk of 
developing ovarian cancer with a genetic predisposition, you could see they're a lot higher than the general population's risk of only 1.7%. Screening, well, there is no current screening for ovarian cancer, unfortunately. There are a lot of studies trying to look at this issue, but we have not been successful. The biggest and most important um, thing to remember about screening for ovarian cancer is the pap smear is not for ovarian cancer. It's not used for that. We do sometimes use tumor markers. There's one in particular, the CA125, which roams around your blood. The problem with this is that it could only be positive in 50% of early stage ovarian cancers and up to 20% will be negative for CA125 in advanced cancers. So it's not the best screening method out there. When you look at CA125, it could be falsely elevated in endometriosis, things called fibroids, liver disease, pelvic infections, any other type of cancers in the abdomen, including uterine, pancreatic, lung cancer, and even breast cancer, as well as having fluid uh, in your abdomen or around your lungs. Pelvic ultrasound is actually our superior method of looking at the ovaries within the pelvis. They can characterize cysts, whether they're solid, cystic, like water balloons, have solid portions and cystic portions. The problem with pelvic ultrasounds is somebody's looking at it and then we have to look at it ourselves and it hasn't turned out to be very good. So what they've done is tried to actually look at this as a screening method and we still find all the patients, but they typically are advanced stage as well. Basically, there's no screening for the average person for ovarian cancer. Now, we do try to screen for women with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. In these cases, we typically do some sort of screening test either with ultrasound or CA125 every six months as well as pelvic exams starting around the age of 35. Now, how can we reduce our risks? Well, as, we say, as I stated earlier, uh, birth control pills work very, very well. We could also remove the tubes and ovaries, which um, decrease the risk of ovarian and fallopian tube cancer by a significant amount. And those women that are BRCA positive, it also reduces their risks of breast cancer. So what do you do with a female when she presents with a pelvic mass? Well, there's a bunch of different diagnostic modalities that we can use. Pelvic examination, ultrasound, MRI, CA125s, CAT scans, they're all there, they all can help us, but as you can see, none of them are specific to ovarian cancer. So ultimately, surgery is the method of choice. There is a newer uh, test on the market called the OVA-1. This I don't tend to use too much because I'm a GYN oncologist, but what it does help is helps the general GYN doctor decide whether they could do surgery for a pelvic mass or a GYN oncologist should do it because there's a higher risk of ovarian cancer. And basically it's a combination of five different biomarkers that they use uh, testing your blood. This is more sensitive and specific than a CA125 alone, as well as an ultrasound. So when a female presents, say, with a pelvic mass to me, it's very important to evaluate them based on their age, because as you know, um, as you just learned, that ovarian cancer increases as age in, uh, increases as well. So in somebody who has yet stopped having periods, it really depends a lot on our size, whether we take them to surgery. So the larger the tumor, if it's greater than 10 centimeters and it's cystic, we, could, um, we typically take you to surgery. If it's less than 10 centimeters and looks what we say simple, then a lot of times we can watch this and most of them will resolve over several uh, menstrual cycles, usually about 12 weeks to 16 weeks. Now things that would make us think surgery should be done no matter what is if it's complex. That means if it's cystic, solid, with septations, there's a lot of terminology we use. If it is greater than 10 centimeters, if we do get a CA125 and it's greater than 100 or an OVA1 is elevated, there is fluid in the abdomen or is there a, or if there is a significant family history in that patient all those warrant surgical evaluation now women that are postmenopausal those women the, were 
more likely to take them to surgery if they have a smaller mass, also complex, if their CA125 is greater than 35, um, or their OVA1 is elevated dependent on their age. These all go to surgery as well. So who should do your surgery? And this is the only um, time that I'll really push a GYN oncologist, but there's general GYN doctors, there's general surgeons, and then there's GYN oncologists. And what's very important is that when a gynecologic oncologist does your surgery for ovarian cancer, we see a 25% reduction in death among these women with advanced stage cancer. So just so you know, if you are being evaluated for a pelvic mass, you might um, think about getting a second opinion with a gynecologic oncologist. Now treatment, the standard of care is a combination of surgery and chemotherapy, and surgery can be extremely complex. We remove the uterus if it's still intact, both tubes and ovaries, which usually includes a pelvic mass, and we take out lymph nodes that run along the major blood vessels in the pelvis and along the aorta, do something called an omentectomy, which is removing a fat pad overlying the intestines, we could do bowel resections, liver resections, removal of the spleen. Our goal at time of surgery is to remove all disease that we see and that we could feel. And that gives you the best survival statistic out there. Now, if you could see, since this talk is uh, supposed to be related to lymphedema, we do remove lymph nodes along the major blood vessels in the pelvis and along the aorta. And so we do have issues with lymphedema on these patients postoperatively, which can be very troublesome and very chronic over time, especially when we don't give them enough time to heal heal completely before starting chemotherapy. Now moving on to another cancer. Um, so looking at cervical cancer, and this is actually of the three cancers I talked to, I deal with the least now when it used to be the most common cancer that we used to take care of. However, cervical cancer, we find a lot of women end up with lymphedema after treatment, and I'll explain that in just a few minutes. Just going back into cervical cancer, and as you could see looking at this chart of cancer cases diagnosed in women, you could see cervical, cervical cancer is on the bottom of the list. We've done a very good job at this. In 2010, uh, just over or just about 12,000 new cases in the United States were diagnosed and about 4,000 um, cancer related deaths, uh, making um, about 1.5% of all cancer deaths in women. Now, if you look at this worldwide, we do not do a very good job at pre preventing cancer diagnoses and death, and it's actually the fifth most deadly cancer in women worldwide still. The incident increases by um, age, and then it, um, it, it rapidly does that in the early uh, 30s and 40s, and then it kind of um, evens out as you get older. It's related to mainly the human papillomavirus, and I'll go over this in just a minute, which you hopefully have heard about, um, as we do have vaccines against this. Other risk factors include early um, onset of intercourse, multiple sexual partners, partners with multiple partners, as cigarette smoking, which is a big, big increase in the risk of cervical cancer, and then immunosuppression. For instance, if somebody has had a transplant in the past and are immunocompromised secondary to that. HPV is the number one cause for cervical cancer. That there are many, many HPV viruses, and we break them down into low risk and high risk. And of the ones that are high risk, they're the most common to cause cervical cancer. 16 and 18 are the most common. Um, in adolescent women, about 77% had have has had at least one high-risk HPV type. Luckily, the majority of women can fight off HPV themselves. And 17% of these women develop abnormal pap smears um, down the line. Now, the problem with HPV is you could have been infected by HPV at 30, but not have any problems until 40. It could take 10 to 20 years for HPV to cause um, harm to the cervix or other places that may lead to cancer in the future.
Now, luckily, we now have vaccines that cover HPV. There's the Gardasil, which covers um, 16 and 18, the two high-risk HPVs, as well as two of the low-risk HPVs that could cause condylomas or warty tissue. And then there's Cervarex, which only covers uh, two of the high-risk HPVs. This is recommended for all adolescents, nine years or or older, and I highly recommend it because we are doing a very good job at preventing cervical cancer, which can be a very horrible cancer to have um, with pain, bleeding, and all kinds of other symptoms. Treatment of cervical cancer is prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. So hopefully the vaccine as well as getting annual examinations with pap smears, which I will not go over that information because that is a whole hour lecture in itself. Um, when somebody does have abnormal cells on the um, cervix and might even be cervical cancer, there's a few different options dependent on the staging. We could take a big biopsy of the cervix, which is called a cold knife conization. Some women with microinvasive cancer um, who are done with childbearing can just have a simple hysterectomy. When they're a little bit larger cancers, we do something called a radical hysterectomy with staging, which includes pelvic and periodic lymph node dissection. And lastly, sometimes we can't do surgery because the tumor is too large, and then at that time we do a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. The last two both cause lymphedema that can be very, very troublesome. The surgery because we are taking out lymph nodes and radiation um, because we actually cover the lymph node region with the radiation, which in itself is a risk factor for developing lymphedema. Now on to my last cancer, and actually the most common cancer that I treat uh, almost on a daily basis with surgery is uterine cancer. It should be discussed a lot more because it's much more common than ovarian and cervical cancer, but very few people do hear about this cancer. Uterine cancer, also considered endometrial cancer, um, is basically cancer of the lining of the inside of the uterus. So. Risk factors include obesity, excess estrogen, um, chronic anovulation, meaning that you're not ovulating um, to have periods correctly, um, tamoxifen use for those women that have had breast cancer, age, diabetes, hypertension, which is usually related to the first risk factor of obesity, um, a hereditary predisposition, as I already spoke about, breast cancer, and um, nulliparity, which means you haven't had a baby, and then early on stage of periods. Lastly, late menopause, um, greater than 55 years old. And this just means that somebody has had a prolonged period of estrogen exposure, and that is the biggest risk factor when it comes to uh, endometrial cancer or uterine cancer. Obesity is the number one risk factor, and if you look at body mass index, there is a significant risk based on your body mass index. It increases five kilograms per meter squared. And then also these women with the higher BMI also have a higher chance of dying from their disease, especially if they're greater than 40 kilograms per meter squared. Protective factors include, again, oral contraceptives, and what this does is it actually evens out estrogen in the patient's body so you don't have high spikes of estrogen that stimulates the uterus. Also, if somebody is postmenopausal and obese, progesterone alone um, can be used, which counteracts estrogen. And in women who are obese, they have extra estrogen because the fat in their body actually converts other hormones into estrogen, and this is why it's a risk factor. So what the progesterone does is counteract the estrogen. Smoking is actually a protective factor. This is the only time I will ever bring up smoking as a good thing, but still, lung cancer, if you remember, was the number one cause of death in women related to cancer. So I don't recommend it at all whatsoever. Lynch syndrome has uh, increased risk of 
uterine cancer up to 77%. So this is one of those hereditary predispositions with an increased risk of uterine cancer, colon cancer, as well as ovarian cancer. And in these cases, when somebody is done with uh, fertility or having babies, then we do highly recommend that they have a hysterectomy to prevent uh, from developing cancer. So these women typically present with abnormal uterine bleeding. Either if they're still having periods, it will be irregular, heavy, uh, bleeding in between periods. If they're postmenopausal, then they will have bleeding when they shouldn't. And of the postmenopausal women who do bleed, up to 20% of them might have cancer. And then sometimes, even though a pap smear is specifically meant for screening for cervical cancer, we do pick up cancer cells from the uterus on the pap smear. However, this is a very small percentage of patients. So if you do present with abnormal bleeding or what we call postmenopausal bleeding, what do we do? Well, we like to try to do a biopsy within the office. It's called an in-office endometrial biopsy. We do it there. It typically is very well tolerated, has very little complications, and actually costs the least amount of money. That sometimes we do have to do dilation and curettage, or DNC, um, sometimes using a small camera to look inside of the uterus uh, to get the biopsy, and that requires some sort of anesthesia. And sometimes we could do by looking at an ultrasound and getting a biopsy while the ultrasound is looking at the uterus. Ultrasound we do typically use in older women because sometimes we don't have to do a biopsy. And what we look at on ultrasound with endometrial cancer is the lining or what we call the endometrial stripe. If this is really thin on ultrasound, then we could actually bypass the biopsy. If it's really thick, then we definitely know a biopsy needs to be done. Now, do we screen for uterine cancer? No. The reason why it's actually not, not cost effective. Um, when we diagnose these women, as you will see, they are usually early stage and um, surgery alone is curative. Now women with tamoxifen have an increased risk of uterine cancer and because breast cancer is so common, there are a lot of women on tamoxifen. However, we have noted that this is not um, cost effective either, so we only biopsy based on symptoms. Now, women with hereditary predisposition with Lynch syndrome, we do um, try to do some screening, usually with an annual biopsy every year, just to make sure that they don't develop this and hopefully um, have them uh, have a, or undergo a hysterectomy um, as soon as they're done with childbearing. Once diagnosed, we do a physical examination. Um, we do do some labs just for preoperative reasons. Uh, occasionally, if we're worried about advanced stage, we'll get a tumor marker um, that we use for ovarian cancer, the CA125, and that's really sometimes will be elevated with metastatic disease. We do get chest x-rays, um, and we hold off on any CT scans or MRIs unless we are really, really suspicious that there's metastatic disease. Now, staging includes um, surgery, and surgery typically is the treatment. This includes hysterectomy, so removing the uterus, the cervix, both tubes and ovaries, as well as the, um, as well as pelvic and paritic lymph nodes. So as you can see, the common theme is removing the pelvic lymph nodes. We have been starting to get a little smarter in the world of uterine cancer, and we are testing the use of sentinel lymph nodes in endometrial cancer, just like they do in breast cancer, to hopefully help with prevention of lymphedema and other complications related to it. So a lot of us, including I, will uh, do sentinel lymph nodes on some of these patients if it's early stage. There's several types of hysterectomies. There are the abdominal hysterectomy, which requires a very large uh, incision, especially if lymph nodes are being done. And, you know, this takes six to eight weeks of recovery time with increased risks of infection, wound breakdown. We also have vaginal hysterectomies. However, we do this very rarely with uterine cancer. Um, and the reason why is because a lot of times we can't get to the tubes and ovaries and we definitely can't do lymph nodes. Now, other types include laparoscopic or even robotic hysterectomies. And these are mostly our mainstay surgery nowadays because we could do 
incisions through very small little incisions, take out the uterus, the cervix, both tubes and ovaries, as well as do all the lymph node dissection that we need with significantly less post-operative pain. Um, you're typically out of the hospital the next day, and by two, three weeks, you're feeling about 85% your time. So we prefer to do this for the patient's benefit, and it's just as good as doing an abdominal hysterectomy. There's also less blood loss at the time of surgery. Now, if you look at stage and survival, you can see we do a very, very good job with early stage with a 90% five-year overall survival. And the majority of the patients, 70%, are early stage. So this is a good thing. Now, surgery, as I said, is typically curative, and it includes the pelvic and periodic lymph node dissection. Now, if you have advanced stage, we do usually do surgery still, plus chemotherapy and radiation. Now, kind of going back to the beginning, but since this talk is uh, based around lymphedema, in most of my patients that have surgery, because I take out pelvic and periodic lymph nodes, there is a significant risk of developing lower extremity lymphedema, which is very, very troublesome. And the incidence could be as high as 10% with just endometrial cancer. The most significant risk factor is the pelvic and periodic lymph node dissection. Most recently in 2013, it showed that 35% uh, rate of lymphedema in women who had lymph nodes removed compared to women who did not when it came to GYN surgeries. So it is very significant and and I do not like to deal with it with my patients because it is very troublesome. So luckily today we have another discussion um, on how to help treat it and prevent it from occurring, which hopefully that you'll find very useful. That's the end. Thank you very much for listening. Again, I do apologize that this is pre-recorded. But if you do ever have any questions, please feel free to contact the Women's Center and they could get a hold of me and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Have a good night.